Okay, we want to welcome everyone this evening to the End Times Bridal Messianic Bible Study, and I'd like to introduce our leader, Joe McBride. I'd like to begin with the most quoted passage of all, John 3.16. The New King James Version reads like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. We're going to take this apart and see what it says in the more original languages. We see God the Father in that passage because it talks about his son. In the Jewish betrothal part of the wedding ritual, it is the father of the bride and the father of the bridegroom who initiate the marriage proposal. There's a document called the Ketubah. And in this case, the Heavenly Father is the father to both. Upon acceptance of the contract, the prospective bridegroom returns to his father's home to prepare the wedding chamber for his bride. Then it continues that God the Father, that's this passage now, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Herein lies an idiom that, in my opinion, has been misinterpreted and misunderstood for centuries. The word world in this passage does not refer to the entire global earth or all the people on the planet. There are no less than three different Greek words in the New Testament which all have been translated into the English as world by King James and other translations. In this particular case, the Greek word is cosmos, and it literally translates to an adorning decoration. You might envision the night sky with glistening stars adorning the heavens. That is, the cosmos. So, why did God the Father love an adorning decoration so much that he gave his son for it? To interpret this idiom, please turn with me to Malachi 3:16 and 17. It is well known and accepted in messianic circles that the Old Testament Hebrew language converses back and forth with the New Testament Greek language. Yeah, I want to start with Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Now this is the bride speaking one to another. And the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Again, this is a description of the bride. The Book of Remembrance is an idiom for the bride's accomplishments, and whenever it's mentioned in Scripture, it denotes the season of the wedding. The Book of Remembrance is traditionally opened on the day of Rosh Hashanah, and it contains the good deeds, or the mitzvot in Hebrew, of the bride. In this case, the good deed written is that she feared his name and meditated upon it. This phrase suggests an intimate relationship much like we should have with our bridegroom today. But let's go on. Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. Again, the they refers to the bride of Messiah. On the day that I make them my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. The idiom of the jewels is very significant here. The word jewels is translated into the English version of the Old Testament 24 times. But only in this passage is the original Hebrew word for jewels used. The word is segula and literally means a special treasure that is shut up or hidden away. This clearly is spoken of repeatedly in the New Testament when the bride is in the wedding chamber and the door is shut. The significance of the idiom of jewels is a clear reference that the bride will also be an adorning decoration to her bridegroom. You can think of any wedding. Who's the prettiest one at the wedding? Remember we said last week that when you see the phrase on the day or in that day, it refers to the day of Rosh Hashanah. It's the day of the wedding, the day of the coronation, the day of the rapture. Verse 17 says, On the day that the bridegroom takes his bride, he will make her his jewels, his adorning decoration. 
So getting back to John 3.16, what the word world or cosmos really refers to is the adorning decoration, which is the bride of the begotten Son. Our Heavenly Father is making a betrothal contract with the bride so that there will be a marriage one day in heaven. The scripture passage goes on to say that the requirement for the bride to accept the proposal is to believe in the Son. The word believe in the Greek language is thesis and literally means a conviction of who your source is for everything and to totally rely upon that source. Herein is what we believe is the primary requirement to be part of the bride. Total intimacy, total reliance upon Jesus Christ, our heavenly bridegroom. Next, we see the phrase, should not perish. This is a Greek idiom for the second death, which comes at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. The bride, which includes the party taken in the rapture, and those who become a part during the great tribulation receive eternal life to rule and reign with the bridegroom. So if we now read John 3.16 in its original bridal language in Jewish idioms, it reads like this. For God the Father so loved the bride, that is, his adorning decoration, that he gave his only begotten son in a betrothal contract that whoever has intimacy with the son and totally relies on him as their source shall not experience the second death, but have everlasting life in the kingdom. It is becoming more and more evident that the entire Bible is a love letter, a marriage proposal, and a kingdom plan for the bride and the messianic bridegroom. Thank you, Joe. That was a very wonderful presentation, and I, am, I get so excited when I hear bridal language in the scriptures, and I, I believe that the listeners do as well. Holy Spirit, make of me the bride Yeshua longs to see. Help me fulfill my destiny I'm the bride of his desire When I fall, please help me stand Draw me near and take my hand Be the journey he has planned for the bride of his desire the day grows dim I wait for him my lamp is trimmed till the morning And 
the bride of your desire.